Uh, thank you very much. Of course, I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here in this amazing place. And uh, so today, I would like to talk about uh, <coughs> a new class of models which we recently introduced, is dual unitary circuits. Does it work? Doesn't. Oh, it's off, sorry. Yes, dual unitary circuits. And uh, I will try to convince you that this class of models is giving a, an exactly solvable paradigm for many body qu quantum chaotic dynamics. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today is based on this uh, recent series of works, which I've done in collaboration mainly with uh, Pavel Koss and Tomasz Prosen from the University of Ljubljana. But uh, we recently uh, started to collaborate on that also with uh, Lorenzo Piroli and Ignacio Sirac in Munich. So, the first question in, that I want to consider in this talk is uh, very broad and very simple. So it is, it, is it possible to describe exactly some aspects of interacting quantum many body dynamics? So, of course, uh, the possible answer to this question is yes, in the presence of integrability. Indeed, in the presence of integrability, one can describe exactly expectation values of some local operators at infinite times after homogeneous quantum quenches, like this is an example, or later in the XXZ chain, or after inhomogeneous quantum quenches, this is the energy density again in the XXZ chain after joining together two chains at different temperatures. Another thing we can describe is the asymptotic entanglement dynamics in integrable models, with the famous uh, calabrese Car cardi quasi particle picture, which can be also generalized to the interacting integrable case. But of course, all these results rely on integrability. So integrability is very interesting, is nice, has uh, a lot of nice properties. But of course, integrable models can't not be considered, uh, cannot be considered as uh, generic. So they are special, and it's really the fact that they are special. They have all these conservation laws that allows us to uh, find those exact results. So the question is, can we find some exact results that are not relying on integrability, <clears throat> so that uh, we can gain some information on the generic dynamics, which is chaotic in general? Uh, to uh, try and answer this question, uh, in the last years there have been several proposals of uh, minimal many-body chaotic systems. So minimal systems that are like simplifying the dynamics a lot in such a way that uh, some aspects are actually solvable. But on the other hand, they allow to uh, identify analytically or, or, or with high precision in any, in any case important uh, aspects. Of the, of the generic evolution. Okay, so uh, the probably most famous proposal in the last year that we saw already in uh, Roman lectures is this uh, local random unitary circuits proposed in the paper here. And uh, the idea here is very simple. One considers a discrete system, for example, a spin chain with higher spin. So we take the uh, local Hilbert space for each side to be d dimensional. And then the time evolution in these systems is uh, defined by applying unitary gates that are connecting <coughs> neighboring sites. Okay? And these unitary gates are uh, applied in such a way that all sites get connected after a while. So first one connects uh, even and odd, for example, and then odd and even and so on. But the uh, 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 basic feature of these, uh, of these systems is that these unitary gates are completely random. So they are both random in space and random in time. So all the squares in this figure are random gates that are uh, taken from the hard distribution. So this system has no conservation laws. Of course, it doesn't even have an Hamiltonian. So it can be considered some sort of opposite of integrable models, opposite limit. <clears throat> OK, but even if. Uh, this system is simplifying the dynamics quite a lot, it still allows to find uh, many interesting results. For example, it's, it gives a general picture for the spreading on, of entanglement in generic systems. 
so-called optimal membrane picture proposed in the paper. It gives uh, a generic behavior for operator spreading. But of course, uh, it has, uh, I mean, many uh, problems in the sense that it doesn't really describe the uh, generic dynamics. Uh, for example, uh, it involves this um, physical driving, meaning, meaning that at each time I will I select a different uh, time evolving operator. The local dynamics is uh, trivialized in the sense that if I consider the expectation value of a local observable under this system, it relaxes in one time step to the infinite temperature state. And uh, the last point, which is the, the one I want to stress upon in this talk, is that this is exactly solvable only in general, only in the limit of local Hilbert space dimension, this D I was talking about before, going to infinity. So there are some exact results also for finite D, but in general, uh, one can solve it only in that limit, as for example we saw again in uh, uh, Romain's lecture. Okay, so um, to try and go beyond uh, these, uh, these minimal systems, uh, another proposal has, has been to consider uh, periodically driven, driven minimal models. So, in this way, <clears throat> so the, the, the two main proposals have been uh, already uh, considered in uh, Tomasz's lectures, actually. So, either you, uh, this is uh, the proposal from the Ljubljana group, you consider some long-range Ising-like chain, which is periodically kicked with some transverse field, or you take the, the same uh, uh, local random unitary circuits I was describing before, but now, once you define the time evolution operator for one period, so you select at random all these gates, but then you evolve with the same operator uh, at further times, okay? So this defines some sort of periodic evolution, <coughs> okay? So um, what's the advantage of that? Well, one of the advantages is that um, since now we can define a time evolution operator, uh, we can actually study the uh, spectral statistics and compare with random matrix theory, so, which is uh, one of the most accepted definitions of uh, quantum chaos. So as we uh, saw in Tomasz's lectures, uh, an interesting quantity to look at to study spectral properties is this spectral form factor. So let me redefine it again. So one considers the time evolution operator at power t, takes the trace, takes the absolute value squared of the trace, but, and, and this is formally the definition of the spectral form factor. But as Domash explained, uh, in general, to compare with random matrix theory, this is not enough. One has to take some sort of averaging over something, because uh, the quantity is typically not self-averaging, so it has, uh, this distribution has basically fat tails. And so, one to make it well defined as, in, as to introduce some average, either in time, so we can average over this t here, over a small window, or over some external parameters. Okay, so this is the average spectral form factors. So, and uh, in both the examples I was describing before, they uh, computed the spectral form factor, uh, in general numerically, and they showed that it agrees with the random matrix theory prediction. Again, also in this case, however, we have the problem that the systems are exactly solvable all, only in some asymptotic limit. So the periodic circuits are again solvable in the limit of infinite local Hilbert space dimension, while the system described by Tomasz, <coughs> uh, as he explained, is, is, uh, makes some assumptions to be solved, and these assumptions are verified only when the interactions are long range enough, when the couplings are long range enough. Okay. So this leads me to the third example, which is the one we introduced last year. So uh, we introduced this uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian, this time-periodic Hamiltonian. So if you look at it, it looks very similar to the uh, long-range uh, Hamiltonians I was describing in the previous slide. But in this case, of course, the Hamiltonian is not long-range. This is just a simple classical Ising, and is periodically kicked with some transverse field. Importantly here, these parameters are not, uh, can not be uh, chosen arbitrarily. They, they must be equal to pi over 4, both these two, and uh, at least in absolute value. And uh, I will try to uh, motivate why in, in the following. So using this uh, time periodic Hamiltonian, one can define 
the uh, appropriate flow k operator just by integrating, taking the time order exponential for one period, which in my conventions is one. And so one finds this uh, flow k operator. Okay, let's look at this flow k operator a little bit closer. Okay, so first of all, um, here you see um, I have a site dependent longitudinal field. And of course, uh, the first thing we can note is that when we set the longitudinal field to zero, this model becomes a quadratic form of fermions. So it's clearly integrable in the sense that it's free. But the remarkable fact is that whenever instead you set these magnetic fields uh, to a value different from zero, then you can prove analytically that uh, it's a rigorous proof that the thermodynamic limit of the average spectral form factor approaches random matrix theory. Okay? This is what Tomas was talking about in the lecture. So this model, I'm, I'm saying that just to say that this model is quantum chaotic according to the definition uh, taken from the book. Okay, but uh, what I want to uh, talk about today is that this model doesn't allow only for the exact calculation of the spectral form factor, but it also allows for the exact calculation of many equilibrium and non-equilibrium quantities, which are of interest. For example, dynamical correlations on the infinite temperature state, entanglement and correlations after quantum quench, and uh, quantities related to operator spreading, for example, the operator entanglement. Okay, but uh, before uh, reviewing some results, let me try to explain you why this model is special. Well, what, is, what is so special about this model? In order to do that, it is convenient to look at the uh, quantum circuit representation of this model. So, it is a non-trivial fact that this model can be represented as a quantum circuit. In particular, the Floquet operator, or its uh, second power, can be written again in, the, in terms of these uh, local unitary gates as I was doing before. But now, of course, there is no randomness, okay? The gate is fixed to some value, which I wrote here. It's not very important to remember, but okay. It's just some value, and it's fixed. There is no randomness, okay? No randomness. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the gate has a special property. And the special property is as follows. So, uh, of course, uh, if one considers uh, the gate and looks at it as a matrix taking the indices A and B and uh, giving back the indices C and D, then this is a unitary matrix. That is just the definition. This is a unitary uh, circuit. But uh, the special property of this uh, circuit is that if you instead look at the same gate as a matrix sending the indices A and C into B and D, so going in this direction, okay, so this in general defines a different matrix, which I will call U tilde here, so in this, so generically, if you take a unitary matrix and you do this uh, procedure, you get something that is not unitary. But for this special gate here, also U tilde is unitary, okay? So it's both unitary in this direction and in this direction. So, but if we look back uh, what this means in, the, in our circuit representation, this means basically that we are treating time and space in the same way, okay? we can really define some sort of time evolution in space, okay, space evolution, okay? And this is the uh, crucial property that allows uh, to do many exact calculations. So uh, these rules can be represented with, by nice diagrams. So one has that uh, these uh, unitary relations are just represented like that, where the blue box is now the Hermitian conjugate of the gate. So this is just unitarity if I apply this is basically tensor network representation. And uh, dual unitarity instead means that if I uh, connect the lines in this uh, uh, sideways way, I still get a nice simplification, okay? This is dual unitarity. Okay, but uh, like to see why this uh, is uh, interesting, let's, let's look at a simple example. Let's look at dynamical correlations, okay? So I'm considering the dynamical correlations between uh, an operator AX at time zero, sorry, A alpha at time, at time zero and position X, and A beta at time T and position Y, okay? So between these two points in the circuit. And let's, let me take, for, for example, uh, Y to be even, because you see in these circuits uh, there are uh, even other effects. So let's take uh, Y to be even for now. 
Okay, so if we just look at the normal uh, space propagation, this circuit has uh, embedded a very uh, strong local structure. So we have a nice light cone in space, uh, sorry, in time for the propagation of correlations. Okay, and uh, by the way, this light cone here is strict. It's not like Lee Robinson, there is no leakage here. It's really uh, exact. So out of the light cone, you exactly get zero. Okay, good. But now, uh, as, as I said before, one can think of evolving this system also in time, okay? So if you evolve in time, you get another light cone, okay? And the light cone you get is this. So now you have that the correlations can propagate only when these two light cones are intersecting, of course, right? So this means that, uh, this simple reasoning means that I can reduce my correlation to something of this form, okay? To a single line. So, Apparently, the, the correlations can propagate only along the light cone. And this can be easily proven by using a, by a simple diagrammatic proof based on the rules I was giving you before. Okay, but let's look at this form a little bit closer again. <clears throat> so, first of all, as I said, uh, the correlation can be non-zero only if uh, x, and t are uh, x and y are separated by t. Okay, so th if the two points are exactly along the light cone. And the second interesting property is that this correlation is determined by a simple one qubit map, right? So basically, if I define this simple map, I give you uh, an operator, you apply the two gates, you trace out one indices, then you trace out one of the remaining uh, of the um, upper ones in such a way that you get again a single site operator. You see, it's very easy to convince yourself that this is just uh, the repeated application of this map, okay? But this, in, in the case uh, under exam, is just a four by four matrix, right? Because uh, my, uh, my, my system was a spin half system, so I have only four independent operators that I can put on one side, okay? So this is just a simple four by four matrix. So I can, def I can easily diagonalize a four by four matrix, so I can easily compute these dynamical correlations. In particular, uh, uh, I can compute immediately the spectrum of this matrix, and uh, it, it looks like that for, for uh, it ising. And in particular, there is an eigenvalue one, which is trivial, and it's just, uh, uh, tell, uh, it's just telling me that the identity operator is an eigenvalue, in a, is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. Clearly, because if I put the identity here, then I can just simplify. But for all non-trivial operators, either I get zero or this cosine of h. So this means that Dynamical correlations among non-trivial observables are decaying exponentially. So they are forced to stay on the light cone and they decay exponentially, okay? For any H, which was my uh, longitudinal magnetic field, uh, different from zero, of course. Okay, so of course I can repeat the same procedure when I take Y odd. So previously I took Y even. Now I take Y odd and instead of getting a, a right mover, I get a left mover. Uh, probably for you is the opposite. Good. Okay. Uh, any question about that? Is, no. Yes. Yes, it would. Good. Any any conservation law here is uh, just uh, transported ballistic. Of course. Yes, so I, I, uh, this leads me for, for, to the next slide. Any other question on that? Oh, yes. Yes. It is just a consequence of this dual unitarity property. So, no, but, I mean, because I mean, uh, self-dual means that when I consider these, these U, U tilde is the same, I'm just saying that, uh, that they are both unitary. Yes, is a consequence of that. So I'm just using that, indeed. I, I, to, to prove this, I didn't use any specific property of the model. I just used those diagrammatic rules that I showed you before. Okay? Good. But so, exactly, an immediate question for that is, okay, but uh, can we find other models who have the same property? And uh, so the recipe is very simple. One takes uh, some matrix. In general, you can take it... Uh, in, with local Hebrew space dimension D, it's fine. 
Uh, and then you impose the matrix to fulfill these dual unitarity conditions, okay? So uh, these conditions are, um, well, they give you really a lot of solutions, but in the case of um, the equal two, we could classify all of them. So we found all the uh, dual unitary circuits that are acting on spin halves, okay? And they can be parameterized in this way. So uh, you see here we have some uh, um, single side SU2 matrices, but the most important um, ingredient here is this V matrix. And this V matrix is basically, you see, some sort of XXZ on, on two sides. Okay, so this family has 14 parameters. Uh, to compare, note that a generic uh, uh, O4 uh, matrix, which is the, the thing I should compare here, has 16 parameters. So this, this has only two parameters less. And there are, of course, many examples one can find, and some of them are trivial. For example, a, a, a trivial example is the swap gate. So the one that is just swapping the two sides. So if I apply to uh, two operators, uh, the, the result I get is just the two operators on, on uh, swapped sides. Uh, then there is, in this family, also a, a trotterized XXE, um, a line of parameters, not, not, not the full parameter space, but some uh, line of parameters of the trotterized XXE. Then there is the subdual easing, but there are really many more. And uh, uh, it's interesting now to see what these uh, dynamical correlations look like for all these systems. Okay? So I go back to my uh, dynamical correlations. So I write again the formula, I still have my M map, and now I can just write it in terms of the eigenvalues of this M map. And now I see uh, different ergodic properties, of course, because, for example, if I look at the swap gate and I look at the M map, it has all eigenvalues equal to one. So meaning that all correlations are just propagating freely, okay? So this is a typical feature in ergodic theory, stuff like that is called free systems. Uh, strange. Then if I look at XXZ, I see that not all correlations are propagating freely, some of them are decaying exponentially, but the X, uh, sigma z correlations are free again. So these uh, kind of systems are called non-ergodic. <clears throat> While instead, self dual kick teasing, as we saw, all correlations decay, and these kind of systems are called ergodic and mixing. Importantly, you can also find cases where the uh, spectrum of, it, of these two maps, m plus and m minus, you remember what these are, so m plus defines the propagation of right movers and m minus of left movers. So you can find instances where these two are different, they have different spectra, and in particular one has a spectra containing uh, uh, more ones than the other, so you get some chiral uh, modes in your system. And you can also find cases where in, in the spectrum of these maps there are some phases, which means that the uh, correlations are not decaying, but oscillating in time. So uh, these are um, called ergodic, but not mixing systems, meaning that the time average of the correlation vanishes, but the correlation itself doesn't. <clears throat> okay, but um, what I, so we saw that if we look at dynamical correlations, we can distinguish uh, different uh, members of this dual unitary family. But there are some quantities that are depending only on the family. So I just use the diagrammatic rules and I find the result for all the family. An example is the entanglement. In particular, the entanglement of a contiguous block, starting from some special states that I'm going to define in a second. So the setting I would like to consider is, is uh, very simple. I consider my periodic chain and I take a subsystem here of length uh, little l, and what I look at is the uh, thermodynamic limit of Rani entropies, okay, that are defined like this, where my uh, row A is the reduced density matrix to my subsystem A, which is the block uh, of spins of length L. So uh, it's, uh, it's easy to, to show that under some very mild assumptions on the initial state, one can write the thermodynamic limit of the reduced density matrix in terms of these quantum circuits like this, okay? So where these uh, uh, balls here represent the initial state. And okay, so this is the subsystem and this is time. Good, okay, but uh, what one can show is that there is a family of initial states that can be written in an MPS form. So I take uh, an initial state written as uh, the following MPS. 
with matrices A and B that are different, and I represent with uh, white and uh, black balls. And I uh, take these matrices to fulfill these uh, two conditions. So the, the first condition is, uh, the second condition written in the slide is uh, trivial, it's just that I, I require this to have a uh, unit norm written in this form. And the second condition is this uh, non-trivial relation that I require on the matrices, and I call this solvability condition. Again, one can solve, uh, one can try to classify all the solution of this solvability condition. And, ah, sorry, I, I didn't say that. Here I'm taking an, arbit an arbitrary bond dimension, okay? So these indices J and K uh, vary uh, from one to some key that I didn't specify yet, okay? So uh, one can provide a complete classification of the solution of uh, these, two these two equations. In the case of D equal two, so local Hilbert space dimension equal two, and bond dimension one and two, okay? So, Bond dimension one in this case would just mean uh, some sort of uh, bell, bell pairs like that are separated because I, I take these two matrices always to be non-trivial but uh, P is here the index uh, is, yeah, is giving me the, the number of values for the index J and the index K here. Okay, so when, I, I'm, not pro, uh, I'm not showing you the, the result because it's not so instructive at the end but one can classify all of them. But, uh, the interesting point here is that by using these relations here plus the dual unitarity, it is possible to simplify this circuit, which I was showing here, for this one, the following form. Okay? So you get two different results on, depending on whether uh, 2t is uh, either smaller or larger than L. Okay? And um, in particular, when 2t is larger than L, you just get the identity, trivially. But when 2t is smaller than L, you get this simple circuit here. Again, this result only relies on uh, these uh, all simple diagrammatic conditions I was giving. Okay. So, but uh, one can simplify this even further because uh, it's easy to note that we have some matrix here, which I can represent as, so the first uh, t lines are just uh, the identity. So I, I have identity times some non-trivial matrix, which is the, uh, the one with the, with, with the bolts, so I call it O. And then I have, again, the identity. And I have these objects just conjugated by a unitary operator, okay? It's just the conjugation of this uh, green bubble with some unitary operators, with, with a unitary operator and his uh, uh, Hermitian conjugate, which are the blue bubbles. So this means that these two blue bubbles uh, are not affecting at all my entanglements, right? They are just simplifying when I take the, the powers and then the trace. So this means that at the end of the day, the result for the entanglement is very simple and it can be just uh, directly written like this. And in particular, uh, it has a few features that I wanted to discuss. So, First of all, uh, we see that the entanglement here grows at the maximal speed for any dual unitary gate. So this is irrespective of the gate being ergodic, being uh, free. It grows always at the maximal speed. So for example, this makes uh, any simulation of this quantity in the computer quite hard. Then we see that at the leading order in uh, uh, T and L, so in the scaling limit of T and L being very large, then this result reproduces the so-called minimal cut result. Okay? So the, the simple, the, this simple piece, where I should just take the minimum between 2t, I'm periodic, and, and L, okay? the, 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 the trivial form. And then it relaxes to the infinite temperature state. These corrections to the minimal cut depend only on the initial state. Okay? So it, they are encoded in this term here, and they depend only on the initial state. So and, uh, to convince you about that, I mean, one can do a simple calculation and take the scaling limit of this term, finding that in the scaling limit, you would find two log key, where key is the uh, bond dimension. So this term doesn't scale with T or L in the scaling limit, it's order one. While this here in the scaling limit is order T, of course. Good. In particular, 
it's also easy to show that this term vanishes whenever one takes a, a bond dimension equal to one. So when, when we take some sort of product state, these corrections are not there and one finds directly at any time the minimal cut result. Um, so, but the question is, uh, can I see some dependence on the specific gate? So this would tell me that integrable systems, uh, non-integrable systems, uh, free systems, they all have the same behavior of entanglement. This is a bit strange. Can I see some dependence on that, on, on whether the, the system is integrable or not? Yes. You can see a dependence on the specific gate in two cases. First of all, if you consider the entanglement of these joint blocks. Why? So let me go back. So if now you have a disjoint block, uh, so how can you reproduce here a disjoint block? It's easy. You just connect some of these lines, like let's say these and these, with the corresponding ones in the, in the lower side, okay? But in this case, if you do that, then it, this operation is not anymore a, just a simple uh, uh, commutation, sorry, um, conjugation with a unitary matrix. It's something more complicated, and you can't get rid of it when you take the traces. So that's why if you take these joint blocks, you see some dependence on the, on the gate emerging. And uh, the second point is that uh, the dependence on the gate emerges if you consider different initial states. But, so if you consider initial states that are not in my solvable class, okay? But uh, if you consider the second case, so if you start from initial states that are not in the solvable class, but you still look at the entanglement of a non-disjoint block, then the statement is that this form, in particular this term, describes the leading order in L and T of the chaotic case. In particular here, I can present you some figures. So these are data for the kick teasing, where I uh, initialize the system in a, run, in, in, any, in a generic product state, and I'm looking at two important features. So this uh, 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 plot here is trying to show you that the propagation speed is uh, again maximal for any initial state, and uh, the important point here is the inset. So you, you, we are just plotting here the, 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 the slope, and we see that this is the integrable case, and it doesn't go to two. But all the other cases are uh, all the other cases where the system is uh, non-integrable, is chaotic. They all seem to agree with the maximal speed of propagation. Another important feature of this uh, minimal cut result is that it predicts flat entanglement spectrum in the sense that all Rani entropies have the same form. And this is shown in this figure here, in particular, again, in the, in the inset. You see that uh, at large enough times, so all these curves corresponding to uh, different Rani entropies, starting from the same state, uh, are collapsing. Okay. So, with this, uh, this leads me to uh, my conclusions. So, uh, again, what I presented here today was uh, uh, this uh, new class of systems called uh, dual unitary circuits that are many-body systems, generically chaotic, with uh, exactly solvable dynamical correlations, as we saw, and entanglement dynamics. What uh, one can compute here is also um, dynamics of other local, ob of local observables or uh, of uh, quantities related to operator spreading, for example, the operator entanglement. So this class of systems is directly extendable to higher dimensions, where one takes a, a circuit made instead of by squares, by cubes, basically. And uh, there are many interesting questions here. So first of all, um, is it possible to, uh, to take a continuous limit of such systems? And uh, this continuous limit, in, 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 in my view, should be really related to some holographic uh, conformal field theory, in the sense that it's clearly going to be conformal. I mean, I only have one speed of propagation. And uh, in general, these systems are chaotic, so the, these correlations are decaying exponentially. And so I expect these to reproduce some sort of chaotic CFT. Um, of course, uh, an interesting question is uh, to consider generalizations that include a uh, few conservation laws. Because uh, for now, the examples I showed you either had an infinite number of conservation laws, actually exponentially many in the system size, or zero, right? So it would be nice to have something in between. And the... Um, 
A final question is uh, concerns the stability under perturbation. This is the most important question. So we are uh, investigating this uh, in depth at the moment, and uh, we are like encouraging uh, numerical results, but uh, to prove things, um, it's always a bit hard. So with that, I would like to thank you, and uh, I'm done. Uh, are there questions? Some comments? Yes. <clears throat> Can you prove uh, relaxation to equilibrium, so to the infinite temperature state, if you start far away from it, so not just locally away from it, the trace state, but globally away? Yes, I can, I can prove it if I start from my exactly solvable family. Of initial states? Yeah, of initial states. Ah, so these were these basically also MPS states? Yeah, these MPS states. So if I start from this family here, you can prove, actually, uh, you can prove that mm -hmm. if you take a neutral local observable, this one relaxes to the infinite temperature state in one time step. And if you take a larger, uh, several with larger support, then it will take basically a time that is uh, equal to the support of the, of the operator to, to relax to the infinite temperature state. While instead, if you take a more generic initial state, which is not in this family, well, what in general happens is that there are some exponentially uh, exponential tails, basically, to, to the to the relaxation. I would start. From, I would start with hatred, hatred. Yes. And to prove, you just have to de just basically, or you can do what we do in, in this paper uh, is really we consider a case similar to that, and we do uh, perturbation theory. So we, we, we take uh, some, some, some initial density matrix, which is uh, e to the i, e to the minus beta magnetization, for example, and we do the large beta expansion. Magnetization is just, can be written as a superposition of product states. Yes. So that... So th those are MPS states as well. So why does it not uh, follow immediately? No, because these are not all MPS states of. the... Oh, ah, yeah, you okay. See, they I have see. some special. Uh, yeah, 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 right. Okay, sure. okay. Yeah. Perfect. Some other question. Um, I, I have myself one. So the, you have a nice formula for the uh, entanglement uh, spreading, right? Yes. Exactly. So, what is the state of the art for more general system? I mean, are there other kind of system where one can prove that? Entanglement spreads uh, ballistically, or this is the sort of only class where something is uh, proven? Okay, so if we uh, talk about proofs, really uh, uh, exact results, I think this one is the only one for an interacting system. So whenever you have interactions, this is the only result I know, even in, in the presence of integrability. Because when you have an integrable system, what, uh, what you normally do is you take the so-called Calabrese-Cardi quasi-particle picture, and we, which has been generalized uh, recently to the case of interacting integrable models. But this is just, uh, it's not an ab initio calculation, right? This gives you, this is believed to give you the exact result in the limit, but it's impossible to prove. So in, in an interacting integrable system, there is no exact result. I mean, no, no, I mean you can, can you have a rigorous proof of, of an asymptotic that it grows like T or things like this? Or I don't even, even that, that is the only... only even, even, even that, I, I mean, there are, uh, for these random unitaries, there are proofs, uh, I think, exact proofs. Um, for um, Rani 2, I guess, uh, and for Rani 2, so for one of those entanglement entropies, I think they can prove something regarding, they can do a calculation regarding the slope, and this is done by mapping to a statistical mechanical problem, similarly to what uh, Roman was talking about. So you, you can do something like that, uh, but, but only for, for, for one entropy, or otherwise uh, it, it's in the infinite, uh, in the limit of infinity, uh, infinitely large local Hilbert space. Anything else? Um, okay, so thank you very much.